Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy from Takshashila. In today's episode, we wanted to talk a little bit about finance and the banking sector, specifically what's happening in the West and how that pertains to the Indian financial system. So if you take a step back, the big headlines in March were all about bank failures in the West, and it seemed like the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, Credit Suisse, and a few others, uh, it had been contained. But this week, there's news that the First Republic Bank, a U.S. bank, is in trouble. They've been having very high customer withdrawals, and there's been discussion about bailouts or kind of someone acquiring it. So again, this is back in the headlines. The question for us here is, how does this banking crisis in the West impact India? Are our banks and the financial system as a whole vulnerable to the same shocks? So to understand this, I'm pleased to be joined by Ruchi Agarwal. Ruchir is an economist who has experience across advanced, emerging, and frontier economies. He received his PhD in economics from Harvard University. Currently, Ruchir is on a sabbatical from the IMF and is a research fellow at Yale School of Management and Harvard Kennedy School. While at IMF, Ruchir served as the head of IMF Global Health and Pandemic Response Task Force. His research interests are in macroeconomics, finance, and innovation. Now, Ruchir has been looking at the evolution of India's financial system over the past few decades and has a forthcoming paper on this topic. And I thought he'd be a really good person for us to learn kind of these issues from. So with that said, uh, Ruchir, welcome to the podcast. Selish, thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Thank you. So let's just dive in. I thought before we kind of get into the specifics, maybe with your background, you can help us understand why does the banking sector or the finance sector matters so much in the real economy? Yeah. So, you know, since as I understand your listeners are not specialists, but are generally interested. So let me just go a bit big picture on this question. As you said, what happened in the last weeks of uh, in the United States with the Silicon Valley Bank, it has made banking interesting again. And I, I, I think that's actually a good development because we want the public to be engaged and understand how banking works. Now, your question is why banking matters and why should the general citizen care? In many ways, you know, the dream for an economist would be is banking should not matter at all. What should really matter is what a real activity firms, uh, individuals, workers do. And banking should really be something in the background. But what we have seen again and again in the history, not just the modern history, but going back a long, many, many centuries, is through financial cycles of booms and busts, banking has this habit of becoming more relevant than it should. And now what we are observing in the US and uh, in, in Switzerland and elsewhere is yet another of that manifestation. Understood. So I think that that makes sense. Now, given that background, what's your assessment of India's financial system today? Uh, Given the stresses to the banking system in the West that you mentioned, uh, are we vulnerable to the same shocks? I think that is some that is a question that is on on a lot of folks' minds. So if you can give your assessment as as somebody who studied this India's financial system in great detail, uh, that would be quite valuable. Right. So I think first, let's just say a very few words on what happened in in the Silicon Valley Bank case, and then we can see, okay, are the same risks an issue for the for the Indian system? So effectively, you know, what banks do, banks typically should borrow money from depositors and other the creditors, and then invest in the real economy. And and if all goes well, that creates value because you're just transferring savings into investments. Now There are many ways in which that simple risk transformation can go wrong. One, which is a very usual one, is just bad investments. Investing in the wrong things or very risky things like project finance or real estate. And then there's a big real estate crisis and there's losses. And then those depositors make losses, which basically brings the government balance sheet, the taxpayer's money into play. Now, what happened here in the Silicon Valley case is a different 
type of risk, which is what uh, the specialists call interest rate risk, instead of betting on the bad in assets that would default, what the banks did was they borrowed short term and invested in long term securities like treasury, so government bonds, basically. And the interest rate risk materialized simply when the Federal Reserve started raising their interests, the value of the assets that they had invested in started falling. And so the, that is the gen, uh, genesis or the basic essence of what happened in in the Silicon Valley Bank and similar bank cases. So, uh, And that basically led to a run on their banks, and that led the government, the U.S. Uh, authorities to step in. Now, are there similar type of risks or or other risks in the Indian financial sector? That's your question, right, Salish? Very quickly, uh, first, yes, Indian banks and financial institutions generally have engaged in similar, what we call maturity transformation, which is borrowing short and investing long. And the Indian banking system holds a lot of government bonds. But the nature of that particular risk is definitely much smaller than what we've seen in the case of banks like Silicon Valley. So that that particular style of interest rate risk may not be something that uh, materializes in a bad way. But are there other risks? And that's something I would like to talk more about with you in the rest of this uh, conversation. Sure. So, so that, that's actually quite an interesting kind of path to go down. Before we do that, I, I just wanted to kind of take a step back because I think I was um, you kind enough to share a draft of your working paper, which which we'll release. Um, uh, kind of, we'll share a link with when it's available. One of the things I liked in your paper was before kind of describing the issues as well as the potential um, solutions. You also trace the evolution of India's financial system, particularly the past few decades, where a lot has happened in India's economy. We've gone through a lot of changes. Um, could you just help us unpack that? I know it's a lot to do uh, two decades yeah. in a few minutes, but could, could you just help us understand that? And that will maybe help frame the discussion as well. Okay, so let me say one preview remark, and then I'll go into unpacking exactly the evolution as I see it. My preview remark is, or disclaimer is, you know, I used to work on India as a, the, the lead economist for India. And one of the main realizations I had is it's, Understanding the Indian economy is extremely difficult and is there is no one protagonist in the story of India. There are many protagonists and the hard thing is to figure out where which actor at which time matters for the narrative arc, right? And so part of what this paper that you refer to that I'm working on with a working title is The Decade That Changed Indian Finance. The goal of that paper is to try and understand who these different characters are in the Indian financial system and tell the story of India through their lens, okay? So let me uh, give you now with that preview uh, a few kind of high-level bullets of how I see big developments in the last 20 years or so, 25 years. Uh, you know, in until very recently, the banking system in India, or let me start by saying the finance, when we say financial system, we mean banks, insurance companies, non-banks, or what's called shadow banks. So we mean many different financial institutions that basically borrow money from depositors or other in creditors and invest in the economy. Okay. But for a long time, the Indian banking uh, financial system was largely dominated by banks. And within banks, it has been dominated by public sector banks. So about 20 years ago, you know, more than 70% of new lending done by banks were coming from public sector banks. Public sector banks are ones that have a majority stake from the government. What was happening in, in the 90s or so, you know, India has had a huge infrastructure need as India has grown and, and there are roads to be built and dams to be made and ports to be made. And so there is huge infrastructure need. And in the 90s, and even before that, the development banks, which are also government guided, were basically doing massive investments in that. The big part of the story happens in the late 90s and early 2000s is these development banks 
make huge losses. There are four big ones in the U.S. in India, and that make big losses, and that had you know led to taxpayer losses. And at that time, they were wound down, and there was a space left in the 2000s on who's going to finance the growth of India, the infrastructure needs of India. And that's where the public sector banks, step two, and I'm moving to step two, that's where the public sector banks step in actively doing large project financing, large infrastructure lending. I'm thinking about here highways or roads or railways, things like that. And big investments were made, but they did not necessarily have the same expertise that's needed to make a good judgment on making these big investments. Okay, let me take a pause there to give you kind of a chance to guide me. But these are the first two steps. I'm going to tell you now what happens in the in the last 15 years. But I wanted to set the stage with that. No, I think that's the, that, that's quite a useful backdrop. As you've been describing it, I also wanted to understand as as you describe stage one and two, that is also the time period that you mentioned when the when the economy was liberalizing, privatization, and all these mm-hmm. things. How correlated were the two? In the sense that yes, the the, the economy had had all these needs and, and things like that. But at the same time, was there an element that as it was privatizing, the regulatory environment became lax, or was there anything related to that 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 could be have been an issue at well, that time? I think you know. As a person, I've worked in many, many, many countries, had the opportunity to work in many different countries at different development stages. And so I have a bit more of a, let's say, a more forgiving view of, of how countries get into trouble. I, in many cases, every country is unique and the society is unique, the ways of taking risks is unique. Right. India has this long history of business families and cultures. My own family, you know, are small business owners. And so uh, in India, we had to figure it all out. How do we once you start liberalizing after 91, you have you have to figure out new ways of doing things. And so it is happens again and again around the world that getting that risk management is not easy. Now, why is it not easy? A big part of my life's work has been about that. Mm-hmm. You know, we cannot avoid the fact that a lot of it is, has to do with politics. What, a, what do I mean by that is, you know, there is a very special relationship between banks and taxpayers. The relationship is as follows. Once you put your money, your, your salary into any bank, you know, uh, whichever bank is your favorite bank in India, you are guarantee you imp- you're getting some guarantee from the government that if the bank fails you will be protected right now w- with that guarantee you don't have to check your money every night you can basically sleep well but that means the bank is able to borrow money from you at a cheap rate now why is the w- government willing to give them this guarantee they're willing to give them this guarantee because in turn the government has the power to do intrusive supervision and make sure the banks are not taking bad risks. And when I say I have a forgiving view, figuring this out and getting the supervision and regulation right is very tough because there are many ways in which bad risk taking can happen. And so the 90s, now going back to your question specifically, I think the problem happened really largely in the infrastructure lending space, which was actually owned by, you know, the large government exposures there. And th- that's an easy way, place where things can go really bad. Understood. And, and given the huge infrastructure push that has been happening over the past two to three years, especially in India right now, that is quite an kind of instructive episode. Yes. Guess. Can I just say one thing on that? It's a very sure. important point you're raising. You know, imagine your friend comes to borrow some money from you and you love your friend, you trust your friend fully. And one thing is the friend is coming to borrow money because he needs to buy some a plane ticket for his family, which is a small expense. Another thing, and he can say, okay, I'm going to pay you back in a month. Another thing is to lend money to your friend to build a huge uh, house for 10 years, which will take him 10 years and he'll pay you back 10 years from now. You know, the type of risk assessment you have to do in the second type of loan and the fact that that loan not working out can basically cause large ex- losses for you, right? Because it's a big exposure. 
means they are very, very different nature of how you do assessment, how you uh, do that risk. And so I think one of the big themes that comes out of my paper, and we're going to get into it, is one of the enemies of risk, you know, the risk enemies in India is, you know, is infrastructure. That's something that gets India into trouble every 10 years or so, basically. Wow, that's a, that's a sobering thought. So now, having said that, we were in stage two when we kind of took Exactly. This- yeah, Very so- good. So now, as I said, the big four big development finance institutions basically get kind of wound or step back. There's a space open. Or we are early 2000s. There's a space opened for who's going to do the lending and public sector banks step in big time. Now, India weathered the global financial crisis of 2007 to nine that period quite well. And there were some problems. But the real issues happened is this big lending on infrastructure lending from the public sector banks that happened in the 2000s, many of them basically went sour. So that's like 10 years later. And mm-hmm. this problem started to appear. And you know, people started realizing this about 2010, early 2010s. You know? And at that time, uh, what since these were public banks, and often they were lending to you know, some quasi-public entity, or related entities, there's a thing which we call evergreening or zombie lending. Basically, going back to the friend example of your friend, you lend money to your friend, his project is not working out, you know, his, his flat uh, that he's building is not working out. So instead of recognizing that this thing is a failed thing, you keep giving him more money to keep hiding the fact that it's not working out and you try to keep him alive. So it's a zombie, but you're keeping the zombie alive. Uh, not allowing it to die fully. That's the idea of the zombie lending. And that's basically what the public sector banks did uh, for a few years. So this problem basically ballooned. Uh, you know, what's in India they call NPA, non-performing assets. You know, the bank's non-performing assets of, of the public sector banks, you know, some cases went to 20, 25%. That means, one, you know, out of every five rupees you've lent out, one more than one rupee is basically gone sour. And, with that, and so that's kind of the recognition. Uh, people start realizing that's a problem in the 2010s. Let me take a pause to give you a chance to step in. I think that's, uh, that, that's quite uh, useful. Uh, please continue. Okay so, now, okay, so now the next part of the story, what happens, it, a big, uh, and this again, where pol- politics and uh, the power of the supervisors come into place. When I say politics, I don't mean a political party or or anything like that. What I mean is the 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 role in India, the Reserve Bank of India has a monetary policy role, which everybody knows about. They set interest rates. But there's another role that they play, which is their their supervisors and regulatory authorities uh, of of uh, banks and other financial institutions. As part of that, they have teams, supervisory teams, whose job is to keep a track, keep a tab on, on risk-taking in each bank. And so when I say the, the powers, the political powers entrusted, there's a legal power, and then there's a de facto operational power. How much do they have, power do they have to truly go into banks and force them to reveal their true picture, right? Most countries, and this is not, not unique about India, struggle with that because Let's face it, you know, banks are often owned by either the government themselves or uh, other prominent individuals or groups. And so most countries suffer, struggle to get, get more supervisory power for, for the Indian banks. Now, a very, very interesting thing happens in India. Around that time, this is when uh, uh, Professor Raghu Ramrajan comes and uh, becomes head of the Reserve Bank of India, there's a recognition that there is an issue. And one of the things that RBI had started to do even before he joined, and uh, just after he joined, this thing picked up, they they got the uh, political support and the operationalization of truly getting these banks to reveal the true picture. And how do we do it? That the tool is called asset quality review, which basically means uh, the, uh, you know, you go in there and you do diagnostics and you say, okay, what is the real health of the banks? And you reveal it. Okay. And that happens around 2015. 
And this basically exposes the real the bad lending that has happened in the 2000s, much of it was infrastructure lending. Understood. One question I had while you were mentioning this is, at least it was my understanding, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the lending was domestic lending. Was there any flavor of any foreign currency in this, or was it purely Indian lending phenomenon? That's a very good question. In, in, in The Indian financial system is fairly closed, you know. They raise money domestically largely and they lend money domestically. So there is a, the foreign banks are a tiny player and then the domestic banks also don't raise large f- funds from non-Indian sources. Understood. Okay. Okay. Right. So shall we talk about the next stage? What happens then? Absolutely. I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, this is almost like page turner for me. So keep going. Yes. Okay. Now think about this. Okay. Around this time, you know, out of every 10 rupees, seven rupees is being lent out by public sector banks. They're everywhere, right? Especially if you go to tier two, tier three cities or rural areas, you know, they play a very important role in the Indian economy. Now, uh, uh, 11 out of like most, many, many of these, a large fraction of these public sector banks, about 11 of them are immediately put under a diet. It's called prompt corrective action. It's like they figure out that they are they are on a very bad path. Cholesterol level is really high. Things are going to go, if they don't correct course, you know, heart attack is imminent. So they're put on a very strict diet. Okay. And that's called, in supervisory terms, that's called prompt corrective action. What that means is these banks, these public sector banks cannot open new branches. In fact, they have to close them. They cannot do a lot of new lending. They have to clean up their books. And only then they can go back to living their life normally, like no more, you know, no going to sh- weddings and eating the samosas, basically. Okay, so mm-hmm. so that's a, that's a big change. So this is where we see finance matters in India very clearly, because if you put a big fraction of the financial system on a diet, what happens? Would you would it be would it be that people who are borrowing from these banks just go to the other healthy banks and just start borrowing from them? And finance doesn't matter, right? So the dream of the economist that banking just should be boring and in the background. Or does the, what happened is that actually the relationships between banks and borrowers really matter. And it's not easy for, for businesses and uh, households and farmers to go and find new lenders. What, what do you think happened? So that's kind of the next part of the story. Understood. And so I guess where you're coming from is there is a lot of spending that needs to happen, which means there's a lot of lending that still is needed. And who is going to finance that, right? There's a clear need in the market. Exactly. Imagine you're buying, you know, you're you're a farmer, you want to buy a tractor, okay? Mm-hmm. And your tractor loan you're going to get before from, uh, from say, under a bank or one of these public sector banks. And now suddenly they're saying, look, we cannot really lend now because we need to clean up some of the past sins. So our lending book, we are being very tight. All right. Now, what do you do as a farmer? You say, okay, let me go. But I knew this guy and this guy was my, you know, cousin's friend. And so I had a relationship with him. Now I need to go and find another banker. Right. And so if you're not able to arrange an alternate borrowing arrangement, that's a big change in the real economy for many people. And you start adding up all the farmers and all the businesses and what we started seeing is there was a space left for lending. Mm-hmm. But, you know, India is, is a story of many actors and many beautiful sub-stories. So this is where other actors came to the fore. Okay, so which were these other actors? The, uh, partly it was the private banks, but many of the private banks in India, as you know, are, are largely operating in big cities. But that there are these entities in India, they're called non-bank financial corporations or NBFCs and housing finance corporations, HFCs. In the West, you can call them shadow banks, okay? They're, they're basically non-banks or shadow banks because they don't take deposits from, uh, typically they don't take deposits from uh, you know regular people. So if they're not taking deposits, remember we said that there's no deposit insurance, so there's le- no limited role of the government. So typically, these banks are not supervised as intrusively as banks. So that's why they're non-banks or shadow banks. Now, in India, these non-banks, or let's just call them shadow banks for short for rest of the talk, were quite tiny. 
right? They were small, but it turns out they became very, very, very important when the public sector banks were put on a diet. And, and you know, there are some of them, I don't want the listeners or you to feel that when I say shadow banks, that is a negative connotation. So maybe we should just call them non-banks. They were doing things which were very innovative, you know? They are, like, I talked to some of them, they, were, they found a way to lend to farmers who were buying used trucks or, you know, people in rural areas that were buying used trucks. And so using used truck as collateral, they figured out a way to lend to these people. So they were, they were using their innovation to step in big time. Okay. Understood. So essentially they were also performing a role of expanding financial inclusion, right? The folks that were not getting access to banking before now had a, had an avenue in which to uh, access finance. Right. So I want to just, uh, put a little bit of, you know, uh, granularity, I want to use the word inclusion as different than deepening. Inclusion, people typically talk about is, okay, do you have access to banking? Do you have a bank account or a, are you you plugged into the UPI in India, for example? Okay. In India is light years ahead in the, in some of the inclusion dimensions than many other countries. But when I say deepening, is can how easy it is for you to get debt, to get a loan, right? And I think that's where they were playing a special role because that's the one of the big challenges of India that we'll talk about towards the end. Got it. Um, so this is fascinating. I, I think what we'll do is we'll just take a short break and then we'll come back because I think on the other side of it, there's there is some interesting developments that, that would be quite good to talk through. So we'll just take a break. Right. Maybe. So let's just uh, leave a little bit of teaser for the listeners. What yeah. is coming up is this, you know, the non-banks emerging from the shadows and play, you know, start lending almost at some years about half of new lending in India, but then they get into major trouble and a big leading to major consequences for the country as a whole. So we're going to get into that next. Sure. We'll be back. We are back. And, and before we left, I think uh, Ruchir left us on a cliffhanger, <laughs> very nicely poised. We kind of set up the, the fact that these NBFCs, non-banking financial corporations or uh, shadow banks, as it were, stepped in when there was a need in the market and they started deepening access to capital, as, as you so rightly put it. But then there was something that happened. And, and so, Ruchir, I'll just uh, hand it off to you. OK, so just before the break, as Shara said, we were starting to talk about the emergence and rise of the shadow or the non-banks, let's call them non-banks, right? NBFCs in India. Now, they not only start lending, but they get a big boost from something else, which you would not have expected, demonetization. So all of you have lived through, you know, most of you have lived through demonetization, and so you know what that is. But one very special thing happened from demonetization is once a lot of money or cash flew into the banking system, right? Now, remember, before the break, we talked about these public sector banks that are on a diet. People, but these public sector banks have one very strong, let's say, aspect, which is they have huge presence around the country to take deposits. So a lot of money after demonetization went to public sector banks, but most many of these public sector banks were on a diet. So what do you do with all this cash coming into your bank? You, many, many of them started lending to non-banks, to NBFCs. So a nexus developed, people put money in the public sector banks, they cannot lend, and uh, NBFCs started getting money from the public sector banks and other sources, and they started lending very aggressively, okay? So this is a time where they basically completely come out of the scene you know, before this, like, let's put some numbers, uh, banks on average were about, uh, have 5% of their lending was to NBFCs. Then within a year, it went to, a year or two, it went to 10%, basically. It just completely, substantially increased, you know, like 50% increase in year-on-year lending from banks to NBFCs. What did NBFCs do with this money, right? As I, we've already started talking about the lent to traditional stuff, and some innovative stuff. But one of the places where money also went is infrastructure lending again, 
And, you know, you have all have heard or many of you have heard of this institution called ILFS, which is Infrastructure Leasing and Financial Services, ILFS, yes. And, you know, they were very actively involved in things just like highways and uh, and uh, other infrastructure projects, basically. So they, they expanded the balance sheet institutions like them. And another place where money went was real estate. Big money went into real estate. Real estate, especially, you know, as you all may know from your families, you know, often uh, in... in a good vehicle for investment, a preferred vehicle for investment for Indians often is real estate because it has collateral value. And so a lot of these NBFCs started lending very heavily and other banks as well to, to real estate. So these are the two. So we are going now from 15, 2016, 17, 18, these exposures increase substantially. Got it. Uh, I, I had one question. So you mentioned that, uh, of course, NBFCs, because they don't take deposits are not as tightly regulated by, uh, for example, the RBI. Is there any regulation or oversight on the public sector banks or the banking lending to NBFCs? Because that is the channel through which money was flowing, right? Right. Now, again, this is a great question. You see, Salish, I think I have managed to convert you into a financial economist because you're. <laughs> uh, that's exactly the type of questions, you know, as, as, as if you're an IMF economist and you land in a country to try to understand the risks, hidden risks in the system, you start exactly digging into those type of questions. Now, it's very important, the question you're asking is, remember, most people at this time we're not even thinking a lot about NBFCs. They were a non-player. You see, when I told the story, when I said earlier, the Indian story is about a story of many different protagonists and actors. They were an actor, which was a, almost like one of those side characters in your Bollywood or, you know, Hollywood or where, whichever movies you watch, you know, and no one paying, not that, people not paying that much attention. So that was a risk, which on the books should be regulated, but were not so actively regulated. Okay, and so uh, there's another very interesting lesson from that, which is it's a lesson on imagination. A frequent thing about how we, you know, regulators or people who think about risk, we are often fighting yesterday's crisis. And so now in this Silicon Valley Bank thing happened with interest rate risk. So now we're going to all there's going to be big focus on interest rate risk. But it's very likely that the next crisis will come from somewhere else. So so this is exactly one of those cases where there was very heavy regulation at that time on banks. And as I said earlier, there was this asset quality review, put even additional focus on banks. But meanwhile, the, the interlinkages with shadow banks became not so, uh, was not so much focused on. And that's just natural because we had never seen such a crisis. And also internationally, even today, Many people don't believe these non-banks matter that much in an emerging market context. You know, so that's something new. Fascinating. So I, I think most of us, listeners included, would know what ended up happening with ILFS. But could you walk us through that and, and kind of how it unfolded? And I think there was another player involved as well, right? Yes, 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 yes. So, you know, ILFS was, you know, I, I looked at the, the structure, the pyramid structure of ILFS it had 302 entities. So each entity could borrow on its own. You know, they had education and maritime and ports and real estate and transportation. And some of these entities were issuing debt on their own. So even at the top, it was hard to know, you know, you had, they had so many children, you had no idea what each children, each child was doing, basically. Okay. So at that NBFC, now we're in 2018, I know ILFS was a triple A rated entity when it issued debt. What that simply means is triple A is the highest rating, the safest rating one can get as a bond issuer. So going back to your friend's example, when your friend is borrowing from you, you know, for example, in the Marwari community, everybody has some implicit idea of someone's credit worthiness. So your friend comes to borrow, the market will say this person is really, really, you know, solid player. He's a solid guy. That kind of thing, kind of, he has a high AAA rating. So ILFS, from that perspective, the market had given it AAA, and so it was super safe. People were lending money, but it turns out 
IFS had done the same mistakes as the public sector banks had done 10 years before, as the development banks had done 20 years before, which is take a lot of risky things which went sour in these large infrastructure projects. Okay, So it's basically the date when ILFS defaults is in the summer of 2018. Okay, They default on a their default was a tiny. So let, just to give you an idea of the size, the size of ILFS at that time was about a little over 1 lakh crore, which is like one, roughly 1.2 trillion rupees, which at that time was about 0.7% of GDP. So less than 1% of a GDP, okay? Now, the beauty, the super interesting thing of the story is a tiny uh, institution like that, failure basically led to a massive, massive shock throughout the system. And why did that happen? So that's kind of the next part of the story that we uh, want to speak, speak about in the next few minutes. Got it. So, so this, this is interesting. One, just, just a small question I had on this is, were the sources of funds for ILFS predominantly the savings of Indian, Indian consumers? I mean, what was the predominant mix of, of their capital? Very good. Very good. Very good. So... You know, ILFS was largely borrowing, was largely short-term borrowing, okay? So borrowing means like borrowing for three months, five months, and they have to roll over that borrowing. Who are they borrowing from? As we've talked already, large part of the borrowing was coming from domestic banks, right? And that increased after demonetization. Second, a big part, basically the rest of the funding was coming from the what's called capital markets. And that's basically mutual funds, insurance funds. So for example, your pension, you know, your your pension may be parked in a mutual fund and the mutual fund's role is to put that money in safe assets, relatively safe assets, which are AAA rated. So a lot of these money were coming. So most of the borrowing again was domestic, but they were coming from these two different sources. Okay. Now this is exactly where the crisis starts. Once there's a default, there's an incredibly interesting thing that happens is these uh, mutual funds have to mark, kind of immediately mark it down their books that, okay, they have to show on their books that there's a loss. But corporations and pensions, uh, pensioners who had put money in the mutual funds, nobody really knew how much exposure your mutual fund had to, to, had to ILFS. So two things happen. First, mutual funds start running on anybody that looks like ILFS because they don't know how bad the problem is, okay? but So that's the one-sided run. So just like there was a run now on the Silicon Valley from the depositors, the, the instead of the depositors, the lenders were the mutual funds who started running on not just, you know, ILFS, but, but I mean, they defaulted, but similar institutions, non-banks. But on the other hand, the people who put money into the mutual funds, they started running on the mutual funds because they no one knew how much exposure each mutual fund had to ILFS or to similar institutions. So there was a two-sided panic. And this is the story uh, I trace in the paper of why a tiny shock basically led to a system-wide panic. Understood. And so what, what was your assessment in terms of what was the overall impact on what we would call quote-unquote real economy? Good. So before that, let me just say one uh, couple of quick sentences on the sec. Now, this happened in, in, in the fall, in autumn of 2018. About nine months later, you know, when the market has started calming and people start going back to the, to the mutual funds and the mutual funds started going back and lending again to non-banks, a second shadow bank, let's say, it's, it's called the Housing Finance Corporations, which is uh, basically largely investing in housing, Divan Housing, had a similar default, considered very safe and suddenly default, totally unexpected. And this second shock was less reported in the media and so, but in a way it had a more, a different type of impact on the economy because people then said, okay, it's not really a one-off thing. There's something really systemic maybe. And that really led to a lot more, it basically led to another run in the system. Okay, now we can talk about what this means for the real economy. But that's kind of the the banking, the financial side of the story. 
uh, sure. it's, let's move to now kind of what is the, the real economy. Let me take a drink of water and let's see if you have a follow up question. Yeah, no, please. I think this is this is quite fascinating. As you are mentioning this in, in Divan and and ILFS, one question for you is, and I'm trying to place it in the context of what is happening now, right? Which is India is spending massive amounts on infrastructure everywhere you go. Roads are being built and yes. airports and things like that. How much of this, in your view, was bad lending versus uh, not projecting out the cash flows to be able to service those kind of loans? So I'm just trying to distinguish right. between maybe good projects, but not the, the, the time horizon is longer versus just fundamentally bad projects? That's a very, very, very good question. You know, not all project lending is bad, and some of them were actually good investments. But the, in a way, part of the problem, and actually this addresses immediately your previous question, what happened to the real economy, is, you know, any of your listeners who have run a business in India know that liquidity often is a key issue. You need cash always coming in, right? And one of the big implications of these two defaults was illiquidity started becoming an insolvency problem. What I mean by that is, suppose you have a building project, okay? And you know you can sell all your flats, okay? But you need to finish the building to be able to sell all the flats before you give the placement, right? Now, you finish 80% of the building and suddenly there's a reassessment. Peop- some other build, uh, promoter has defaulted and everybody's worried now you may be a bad guy. Okay. So you may find it now really hard to finish your building project, even though you would have been a good person. And so, and you would have done all the delivery. And the longer that waits, as you know, the things get worse. It becomes harder to finish the project. And so Mm -hmm. in this time, that's exactly what happened was there were some definitely bad lending, but the even very healthy projects became in default because illiquidity problems started becoming insolvency problems. Understood. And so uh, given the small size that you'd mentioned, I think that the figure you'd used was like 0.7% of GDP, but the outsized impact you had, it, it had, does this point to like a confidence issue and is the, was there a role for the kind of government or somebody to step in and, and kind of calm the markets? Because it seemed like a very small number that then just kind of kept, that, that whirlpool kept expanding, right? So, so let's, let me break that into two parts. First, this story is extremely interesting for students of, of uh, economy and uh, macroeconomy and finance like me. Uh, you know, I've been a student of these things for for two decades now. For me, the beauty of the story is it really shows why finance matters and why getting it right, the policies right, matters. Now, you know, in 2019, people don't talk about it as much, but India's growth rate basically fell all, like, roughly 3.7%, roughly, if I remember. It was one of the slowest growth. And if you look at the private demand, it was one of the weakest private demand, basically went close to zero. One of the worst such episodes since the 1991 crisis. So it, it this tiny shock basically led to, in my view, the story I tell in this paper is one of the worst, most severe economic downturns. Okay. And that's where, where I say there's a real effect through the mechanisms that we've talked about. Now, your question, what did governments do and what could they have done differently? You know, the Indian regulators uh, and supervisors and the Reserve Bank of India and others are uh, the Ministry of Finance. They're extremely sophisticated. They've done so much thinking. And I mean, I invite all your readers to download the, the Financial Stability Report, which is issued by the RBI twice a year. And just so interesting, the amount of analysis there is. So it's not that these issues were not understood by the by the regulatory and supervisory authorities, often it ends up becoming an issue of, you know, of what is the right way to address it. So now remember that this is still a period where people don't think non-banks matter. And even today, I have difficulty convincing people that these, you know, non-banks are a key part of the story. So there is a philosophical issue from that perspective, right? If you've spent 30 years of your life focusing on banks, thinking about non-banks. That's happened in the United States after the global financial crisis. 
that was a crisis started in the non-bank sector, the shadow bank sector, right? The, the dealer banks, Lehman, Bear Stearns. So this is basically India's Lehman or Bear Stearns moment, but except these were smaller. And so it's smaller institutions leading to big real shocks. So the authorities were definitely very engaged and they did a lot of measures. So big part of my paper is detailing and studying all the things they did. Now, could they have done something differently? This is, of course, controversial and people have different views. One specific thing that I would like to highlight for consideration for your reader, uh, listeners is what's called a uh, lender of last resort or emergency uh, lending of, of central banks. What central banks do is they have a window which is open to financial institutions that are otherwise healthy but are facing a run because of some panic, okay? Now, in the Indians' case, that that's role is served by the RBI, and they do have access to that window for banks. Now, a big debate at that time, and not just in India, but other parts of the world is, should non-banks have access to such a window? Mm-hmm. In the Indian context, the what the RBI did was it flooded the system with a lot of liquidity, but it didn't give it directly to the non-banks. It gave it to the to the banking sector first and encourage the banks to in turn pass on that liquidity to the non-banks. Okay, question is, is that the right way to go? Now, I'm getting a slightly technical, but it's important. Imagine the story here. What's happening is there are many non-banks, some of which are, are rotten apples, but you don't know which. So the market started doing kind of a a flight to safety. Say, if you have any smell, bad smell of some rotten apple down there, I don't want to touch you. So even though the RBI was pushing a lot of liquidity into the banks, the banks were not really always able to channel that liquidity to the potential question mark cases, right? So money was, even things, firms that were pretty strong, I don't want to name names here. uh, I listened to many uh, earnings calls, they were really struggling in this time. 2019 was a very tough time. So my message is realizing that and realizing that each of these financial institutions have relationships with borrowers and firms and industries. And anytime they're starving for liquidity, that means their borrowers are starving. And understanding that those relationships are very sticky, right? That's how the real effects of finance starts to play out. And that's why I think this is a fascinating story for to understand more, not just for Indians, but for people around the world. This is very interesting. And as somebody who kind of lived through this, I mean, read this in the newspapers and, and saw this whole thing unfolding, I really hadn't connected what was happening with ILFS and uh, and Devan. Obviously, uh, we knew there were some issues there, but connect that to the overall slowdown and, and the linkages there. So I think it's um, it's quite interesting. I just want to now shift focus and, and come back to the present. Uh, I think we've now got a good understanding of um, kind of the evolution of India's financial system and, and how, how that has kind of grown and, and some of the challenges. Now we kind of come back to the question we had opened the podcast with. Few things that, that uh, I just wanted to frame it. Obviously, we, we've talked about the challenges in the West. Uh, rising interest rates, like you mentioned, have, have led to a lot of issues in, with some of the banks in terms of exposing their, their lending. Now, when I look at India, the conditions are slightly different. Economic growth is happening and it's projected to happen at 5 or 6%, depending on which figures you use. A huge investment in infrastructure is, is underway. Consumption is also growing. So it seems to be like two different things. And so I'm just curious, what is your assessment of the financial system today, uh, given what's happening in the West, plus some of the investments that are happening here as well? Okay, there, there's a lot to unpackage uh, sure. back there. Let me say one first thing. Between now, between today and 2019, something else happened that changed our lives. The pandemic. Yeah. And, oh, I, I've forgotten about that. But okay. Let me just say, <laughs> let me just say two, uh, two sentences on that, all right? Uh, I basically had finished writing this paper in January 2020, and then the pandemic happened. So I spent two last two, three years of my life fighting, heading the IMF's pandemic response, uh, 
So, mm-hmm. but I was also keeping an eye on what's happening in India on the side because I, I love this story and I, I love understanding what's happening here. The Indian authorities did a lot, and I think they must be congratulated in quite successfully handling the pandemic uh, from a financial side. I'm not speaking broadly because there are many other things to talk about, but from a financial sector side, in a way, you know, they the Indian authorities introduced uh, several loan moratoriums, as you all know about. There were guarantee schemes to help the small, medium enterprises. There are a lot of measures that happened. And because interest rates came down, it allowed, there are also issues, concerns about the health of the corporate sector. And it allowed the corporate sector, it allowed the non-banking sector to lower their interest expense and restore their health a little bit. Okay, So that's been a good outcome. So we did not have a financial meltdown. That's a very good outcome. And uh, we need to recognize that and, and, uh, and appreciate. You know, there are a lot of heroes in central banks around the world who I like to at least keep in my mind because they are fighting and also in ministries, finance around the world, who are doing things, firefighting that prevent a meltdown. And so we don't know about them because... There is not a meltdown, right? We only blame them when meltdowns happen. So I, I want to appreciate that. Now, having said that, let's move to today. Where are we today? I want to highlight three things, three challenges that are legacies that remain and one opportunity that remain from the India's own financial crisis moment of 18, 2018 and 19. One is what I call... Let, shall I take a second break, let you respond, then I go into these three, so just to give a break? Yeah, sure. So I, I just want to interject there. I think you very rightly pointed out kind of the COVID lost years, the two years that we've all gone through. Were there any structural changes that happened during that time, or was it mostly kind of firefighting and responding to events? So I'm specifically referring to the financial system. Did those two years fundamentally change anything, or it was more of uh, responding to events as they occur? It's a great question. I love I love that question. Actually, there was firefighting, but what's incredibly interesting is there were also a lot of structural reforms. We're not talking about outside the financial system. There were a lot of ha- things happening there, but within the financial system, you know, we we had the yes bank uh, failure, as you know. But and so there was a lot of there's Lakshmi Vilas bank failure. So a lot of the firefighting was legacy firefighting which was from pre-pandemic plus the pandemic firefighting. So, But structurally, by the way, I should also mention the PMC bank crisis. So a lot of fascinating things happened. But structurally, you know, there's uh, some, some interesting things have happened. One is there was a suspension and reactivation of the, of the insolvency and bankruptcy code, right? This is a big landmark legislation in 2016 in India and now, there, the authorities are trying to kind of refine it. There's another big thing that happened is they've created a bad bank or what's called a bad bank, which basically buys non-performing assets and tries to deal with them separately, right? So that's another big development. And lastly, and very importantly to our story, I just wanted to flag, there is a new development bank in India, the National Bank for Financing Infrastructure and Development, NAFFID. Right, uh, which was launched in uh, 2021. So, so that's another big development, which we don't know yet how that will shape the future. So, I would say those are the few structural and some I flagged some uh, firefighting things as well. Makes sense. Okay, so then you were coming to the uh, you said three challenges and one opportunity uh, okay. based on today. All right. So I want to say you know again we are. There are so many things to say in the broader economy, but sticking closely, you know, to the financial sector. First challenge is what I call India's great funding imbalance. Okay, the the way I want your listeners to imagine is, you know, you have two types of financial institutions. One is the are the banks, and the other are the non banks. Within the banks, you have the public sector banks. Now, the the strength of the public sector banks and banks in broadly in India is their liability side, their deposits. You know, everybody is happy to give money to these large public sector banks so they, they can borrow cheaply. Okay. 
but their relative weakness is they have not necessarily all the innovative either they are innovative because they're you know used to doing things in the in the public sector way for some public sector banks although some are doing quite fascinating and interesting things or they are extremely conservative you know and, and that's true for several private banks as well so you know they may not go and find new ways to lend people money on how to buy a used scooter you know but many people in india as we know it's it's, an, it's a dream to get a scooter even if it's used you know and so my how can we get those people the right credit and not have to go to their local money lender and how can the financial institution serve those people that's the question for me and i think that's where the strength of the second group the non bank financial institutions comes into play they are finding new ways and also i would say digital new players like digital people who are trying to do digital types of lending so those people are trying to figure out how can we get serve the the real people of india you know like two thirds live in rural areas many live in tier 2 tier 3 cities you know how do we get to those people and that's where the non bank shine their that's their strength the asset side but their weakness is they are not able to get cheap deposit funding right so they have to rely they are always at the mercy of the market or the banks and they have to raise money in a costly way so what is the great funding imbalance is this gap between the two so first is we need to figure out how can we combine the two and reduce this vulnerability funding vulnerability like we saw in 1819 okay and i have some ideas on that so that's kind of one okay okay so two on two is what i call the india's financial deepening hurdle okay now for me you know as a student also of india's growth i've done some work on that been studying what's happening in each district each uh, pin code and you know india's story is very complex there are you know one in four people in india live in bihar or uttar pradesh right that's roughly one in 25 people in the world live in those two states and uh, the income in those two states are substantially lower than incomes in places like maharashtra or delhi or other more prosper relatively more prosperous parts of the country so it's very important that there's a pathway and the financial sector plays a role for prosperity to reach all parts of india especially in these states that have large income gaps okay now what's the financial deepening hurdle if you look you know one, there are various ways to measure this but if you look at the one way is to look at the credit to gdp ratio which basically means you know how much lending there is relative to the income of of that state or that person right on average on average in india it's like 50 60% but in many of these states uh, that are lagging behind it could be t- roughly half of that right so there's not a lot of credit available for people who are living in the relatively poor parts and we need to figure that out we indians have been using various tools like what's called a priority sector lending i don't want to get into the technical details but it has really not been that effective so we need to really do a rethink of of that that's the financial deepening hurdle and that's why i think this story and i want more you know phd students academics journalists to start thinking i want to i one of my goals and i'm very grateful that you allow me to have this conversation with you is i want our listeners to think more deeply about this because this is not something that one person or group of people can solve this requires a lot of creative thinking from different types of spaces quickly last thing and i'll just say it and we can talk more is the third challenge is what i call india's growth strategy trilemma the trilemma means basically you know i imagine the leaders of a country and india applies to india as well they are trying to typically do three big things they want to get balance economic growth one side second they need to balance financial or fiscal stability so they basically things don't blow up and third they're often championing the uh, nurturing national champions which has additional objectives beyond just growth or stability the trilemma i call it a trilemma because my what i discuss in the paper is that trying to push towards any one of these three different things means you must sacrifice a little bit of of the other two 
Okay. And we can talk a little bit about that in the follow-up further. Yeah, no, I, I think this is very interesting. I think um, when you place it in the context, for example, UP and Bihar with, um, I don't know, around 200, 250 million, the, the population, it really brings home kind of the both the challenge as well as the opportunity that is there, right? Yeah. Like any, any changes you make, it directly impacts such huge kind of swaths of the population that it tells you the scope, kind of the importance of, of this project. So th- that, that makes a lot of sense. The trilemma is is interesting, particularly as a lot of the conversations have been happening in recent times, post the whole Adani Hindenburg report about the role of big businesses or corporates or conglomerates in India. So maybe if you can just unpack that a little bit. I know that we are at the final stages of our no worries. Uh, podcast, but if you can just unpack that a little bit to help our listeners understand what this trilemma is or what the trade-offs are. Yes. So, you know, there is a revival. I have another piece which I called uh, Industrial Policy and uh, the Growth Strategy Trilemma. Uh, In that piece, what I basically talk about is the revival of industrial policy. Industrial policy is basically a fancy way of saying governments finding ways to give direct support to firms or industries that go beyond simple subsidies and more involved support. And a big way that industrial policy support happens is through what I call uh, establishing national champions. Now, why would a country like India want to establish national champions? It's not always necessarily for any... It can be for good reasons, right? Some A country leaders or leadership, let's say, uh, in any country may want to have uh, investments in areas where there are positive externalities, right? So an example of that could be the railway system, you know, speed rail system in China. You know, have no private firm individually is likely to take that investment, but once such a railway system is established, the network benefits so many people beyond just the private returns the company will make, right? So that there may be growth uh, objectives that may induce a, a leadership to pursue uh, support national champions rather than just take a more laissez-faire approach. Another could be that they're worried. There's some growth anxiety, basically, that, look, if you don't intervene, the system may not give you the growth. And India has a growth imperative. We need to raise so many people, you know, billion people uh, still can move in from the rural areas into the urban areas and have a different part of life. Like many of the listeners, you know, uh, most of the listeners of this of this podcast are not representative truly of if you, what you would imagine is the median Indian, right? They're very different lives than the people who can listen to podcasts typically, right? And so uh, that's that's the anxiety. There's an anxiety. How do we deliver growth for them? It's not just an electoral benefit, but there's also a genuine benefit from that. And you may think, okay, let's go and support some champions who I can trust and know that will deliver on those growth imperatives. And that's something we see in several countries. And that could be one more reason why some you know countries like India may pursue it. And last reason I would just say it could be also a worry that the the private sector may be taking too many, you know, unstable risks. And so you may want to support like in the Indian case, traditionally you had the traditional business houses like the the Tatas and the Birlas who had, you know, often dominated multiple industries, right? And mainly they they were able to enter into multiple industries because they're considered safe and therefore implicitly, not often necessarily explicitly, have had support through some national champion type policy, okay? That's what I mean by national champions. And the problem happens is anytime you start pushing on the national champion side, because you are kind of picking winners, you are very likely to either... It's possible that you're not picking the best, allowing the best firms to perform, so you sacrifice growth. Or it's possible that you are putting too many eggs in one basket, which likely leads to large losses like later on, often for taxpayers. Got it. So this is in itself, I think, is is worthy of a, of another discussion, but uh, we can yes. leave it here. I'm I just say maybe one sentence quickly on the, what what I say in the paper in the Indian context. I think the special thing here is uh, there's a discussion in India on privatization of banks. And one thing to worry about or be mindful of is 
if there's too many big champions, uh, you know, if you have few banks that become big players in the financial system in India, they that could be costly potentially for India because you they may not have the same incentive to go to the tier two, tier three cities or rural city areas to do lending because they're making good profits anyway by just doing the safe banking, right? So, mm-hmm. so that's one area where things can go potentially wrong. The second is, again, in the infrastructure side. Now, you know, I uh, without any prejudgment, we need to see what this new development bank that was created in 2021 will do, right? It could play a positive role, but we have to make sure it doesn't fall into the same trap as the three pre- previous infrastructure-led you know, financial misadventures have happened, right? So that's kind of the other thing to be mindful. And the third thing is a corporate sector, something to be more, looked more carefully is the is the concentration and too big to fail corporations that are likely emerging in the Indian context. Got it. So I think that's that's actually a pretty good kind of summarization of our discussion as well, which is multiple waves of kind of financial growth, all of them tied to a lot of infrastructure spending. And now the concern here is we need to be mindful about as we're making these big spends uh, to learn hopefully from uh, from some of the episodes in the past as well. Yes, you know, whenever I'm traveling any place in the world, if I see somebody's building a road, first thought is, wow, that's good that now somebody can deliver their milk on the bicycle without that spilling. And so that's good. But second question is, okay, who's financing this? And we should always ask, where is the financing coming from? And ultimately, is are the taxpayers protected? Are is often somewhere one way or the other taxpayer money is involved, no matter where this these such investments are happening. So we should always the big more investments are happening, the more it's good for all of us to be involved in thinking through the governance, and making sure these investments are truly helping the people, the citizens, while protecting the taxpayers. Absolutely. All right, Ruchir, I really wanted to thank you for for kind of taking the time and walking through this. Like like I said, there, there are enough areas here where we could go into uh, its own podcast, but I, I'm aware of the time as well. So um, thanks for taking the time and explaining this so well to, to our listeners. It was a great pleasure and thank you for having me and happy to talk further if there's interest. Thank you. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, If you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.